sharing my screen, if that's okay. How does that look? Am I, am I sharing? I am sharing. Okay. So, um, so, so I'm, I'm going to talk about aesthetic experience and you might think uh, that's just boring. Uh, there's been a lot of talk of aesthetic experience, but what could I possibly say that's not, um, not been done before? But I, what I would like to do is to, is to draw your attention to an aspect of aesthetic experience, which I think uh, has been a little um, under, um, didn't, didn't really get the, uh, the attention that it deserves. Uh, by the way, so I get all these messages of people um, joining the waiting room, which means that it beeps a little bit. Is that, is that annoying? <laughs> well, whether or not it's annoying, that's how it is. So, um, okay. Sorry, so, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to to fix it to silence the, the ringing. Um, it doesn't disturb me as long as it doesn't disturb you guys. So, so yeah. So I, I'm trying to I'm trying to say something new uh, about. Um, actually, I'm just gonna. about aesthetic experience. So, so here's the kind of general uh, light of the land in, in, uh, in thinking about aesthetic experience. And uh, so the question is, how, how is it, how, how should we characterize aesthetic experience? And that's one obvious choice would be to say that, well, we should, uh, we should characterize aesthetic experience in perceptual terms. I mean, it's an experience, right? So uh, if we wanna make clear about how aesthetic experience is different from non-aesthetic experience, we should make, we should refer to some kind of perceptual uh, feature of it. So one uh, widespread way of doing this is to is to talk about you know what are the properties that we're perceiving. Maybe when we have an aesthetic experience, we perceive different properties, beauty, gracefulness, or something like that, from uh, the kind of properties that we experience that we that we experience when we have a non-aesthetic experience. When we have we experience properties like I don't know, being red, being a car. Um, uh, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about this thing. I'm just going to, to tell you how um, how people have been thinking about. It aesthetic experience. Um, another way in which um, perceptual can somehow characterize the aesthetic experience is in terms of attention. So I, I myself, I'm trying to do this. I get two separate, uh, somewhat separate account, accounts of this. So you might think that uh, what makes aesthetic experience different from non-aesthetic experience is that your attention is ex exercised differently. So one way of catching this out is to say that your attention is somehow distributed, but at the same time focused, so distributed across properties, but focused on the same object. Or you might think that the tension, uh, when you have aesthetic experience, you're not only attending to the object that you see, but you're also attending to your experience itself, or, and especially the relation between the two. Um, so, you know, we can, you can play around with that, but that's not what I wanna do today. It's not, I'm not going to somehow defend my own view, that's, that's boring. Uh, it's just that's 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 another way in which you can somehow think of aesthetic experience in perceptual terms. Uh, a second kind of big group of of views about aesthetic experience try to somehow think that characterize it as evaluative. And one big player here is the kind of valuing for its own sake view. So the idea is that if you have a, an aesthetic experience, then you then you then you kind of value this experience or the object of this experience uh, for its own sake. Again, I'm not going to assess this view, it's just that so it's out there. Now, one thing that people have not really been focusing on in terms of characterizing aesthetic experience is, is what you do, is the action that you perform. Um, and that's exactly what I'm trying to, to, to do today. Uh, and you might think that that's just, that that's just silly because uh, one very often em emphasized, you know, kind of a con con in going back to the Kantian tradition, um, emphasized feature of aesthetic experience is that aesthetic experience, what, what makes aesthetic experience special, is that it's cut off from the practical. So there's somehow there's less action involved. Um, uh, when we have normal experiences, you know, when we are driving a car, we have experienced pedestrians, then that's all kind of connected to action. It's all action relevant. Whereas aesthetic experience is uh, what, what makes it different is that it's not so action relevant. It's, it's, um, it's really cut off. But what I want to argue is that we should really pay attention to what we do when, while we have aesthetic experience. We can, we can, that's, uh, that's a really important aspect of aesthetic experience. So, um, oops. 
So, so then, then this is the question we should, uh, we should ask. What, what is it that we do when we engage aesthetically? And, uh, and there's kind of three kinds of answers that you can have. The first one is the simplest one, is to say nothing. You do nothing. Aesthetic experience is something that happens to you. It's just it's kind of a, a wave that crashes over you, or, or uh, so it's, it's, some, it's something that you don't, don't have any control over. It's just something that, that happens to you. And you're just a passive uh, sufferer as it were, of, of the aesthetic experience. Um, so I don't think that's true. But here is, here is, a, here is a, and I don't think that many people would think that. I mean, sometimes it seems like that's, that's exactly how aesthetic experience works. Uh, but, um, but that's not kind of a general feature of aesthetic experience. Now, the second, second option is to say that, well, there's action involved, but it's non-intentional action. So philosophers of action make this distinction between intentional and non-intentional actions. So the intentional action is when, I, um, when I'm trying to do something and I do it. So I'm going to try to, uh, to touch the, um, the, the camera of my computer and I do it. It was an intentional action. But there's also non-intentional action. So I've been gesticulating like crazy, um, which is what I do. And, and uh, also like stepping left and right, because what I do, that's what I do. Uh, none of this was intentional. I, I was not trying to do that. There's not, none of that was very um, premeditated or deliberate. It's just that some, something, something we do. And there's a, there's a lot of kind of, uh, it's a gray area between the two, so blinking, swallowing, are they intentional, non-intentional actions? In any case, uh, a, uh, to go back to aesthetic experience, it seems like a, a, um, an, an attractive view that when we have an aesthetic experience, we do perform non-intentional actions. So for example, we move our eyes, right? So looking at the painting, then we move our eyes depending on what kind of features there are on the painting. That seems like a, uh, a non-intentional action. It's an action, it's very much an action, but it's not an intentional action, or at least no, very often it's not an intentional action. It's not, it's not that all right, now I'm going to look in the left, uh, in the bottom left corner of the painting, and then I do it. It's just something that, uh, that I do, but I'm not doing intentional. So, uh, but what I'm going to, uh, to argue is that it's a really important aspect of aesthetic experiences. It's really important to pay attention to what it is, what kind of intentional actions we're performing while we have aesthetic experiences. And what, I, what I'm trying to argue is that very often when we have aesthetic experience, we are actually trying to do something. We're, having, we're, we're performing an effortful action. And in that sense, that's actually gonna be a different um, experience from other kinds of experiences, like the experience of red. When we have an experience of red, if you put something red in front of my eyes, uh, then I'm gonna just have an experience of red. Um, it does not take effort. It's not the case that I have to try to see the red in order to see the red. So, uh, so there's a big contrast here between aesthetic experience where there is an effort for action going on and the experience of like a color experience, the experience of red where there's no effort for action going on. So that's a kind of a compare and contrasting. So that's a contrast, but here's a comparison that's, that's gonna be uh, quite um, important later on. And that's the analogy with emotional experiences. So very often emotional experiences are also experiences where we are actively trying to do something or effortfully trying to do something. So, um, and, and that's in the emotional literature that's often called emotional regulation. And the problem with that is, the, and that's a nice rich literature on that within the philosophy of emotion and also a psychology of emotion. But the emotion regulation literature mainly focuses on negative emotion. So the idea is that if you have a negative emotion, you're trying hard to somehow have, that, have less negative emotion. But what I'm trying to focus on is kind of the, the opposite of that here. When we have a, uh, when, when we're trying to achieve something more, something positive, something that we know is going to rewarding an aesthetic experience. But that also happens in the emotional domain. So very often you are trying to, uh, you are, you know that you should have a certain kind of emotional experience, but you're not having it. And you're, and you're trying hard to, 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 to get it. So one example would be, I don't know, you're at a funeral of a person who, you're, who, you, who you really care about, but somehow you're not feeling sad enough and you're kind of trying to make yourself feeling sad, more sad. And then it's the opposite of that when you're, I don't know, you're, uh, you're, on your, uh, you're at your wedding or something and you feel that you should be like really over the moon, but I don't know, there's this uh, you know, mosquito bite on your elbow and it's really scratching and I don't know, your, uh, your feet are too warm. Whatever. So, so you're, and you know, you can't really focus on the happiness and you're trying to somehow 
make an effort to feel happier, to feel, uh, to have more of the emotional experience. So that's, um, that is called emotional regulation. And I think that something very similar is going on in the case of aesthetic experiences. And I, I put in, in parentheses that maybe it's also happening in religious experiences. I don't have firsthand experience of that, but I understand that, uh, that, that, that's, uh, that, is, that is something that, that religious people report that they very often, they, when they, they actively are trying to have some kind of religious experience. Um, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. Uh, so let me just give you two examples to, to just drive home how, what kind of actions I'm talking about that are involved in aesthetic experiences. So the first example is about aesthetic education. So uh, I think that this, um, these intentional actions that we perform in these effortful actions of having some kind of aesthetic experience is extremely important for the way we acquire an, our aesthetic uh, musical and so on taste, and especially important in early years and uh, when in childhood and especially teenage years, when uh, for some reason or other you think that, well, this is a work of art that I should be, I should feel that I'm blown away by, but very often, you don't feel that you're blown away by it, and then you you try hard to 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 be blown away by it. So um, so I think that's a really important and kind of neglected way in which uh, musical taste or taste in in in, uh, in the domain of art develops in general. There's been a lot of talk in uh, both in the aesthetic domain and psychology in general about the mere exposure effect. So the mere, mere exposure effect is this. Uh, pretty well documented psychological phenomenon that if you are exposed to a certain stimulus, then it's gonna make you like stimulus of that kind more. And there's been nice experiments, including in aesthetic domain. So, uh, so James Cutting, uh, who's not really a, an aesthetician, he's a, he's a psychologist at, uh, at Cornell, um, but he's, he has this uh, longstanding interest in, in aesthetics. He did this little experiment when in, um, in his uh, lecture on audition or something. He just put in randomly various impressionist paintings um, between the slides without any explanation. And, uh, and then at the end of the, so that he did this throughout the semester. And then at the end of semester, end of the semester, he, he uh, tested the, he kind of, he, he, did, he made a, he, he performed a test on the, on the students about how much they liked which of the paintings. And there was a very clear linear correlation between how often a certain painting was presented and how much uh, the students liked it. So that's supposed to be like a nice demonstration of how a uh, mere exposure effect works just because you're exposed to a certain stimulus, in this case, a certain impressionist painting, that's gonna make you like that painting more. So there's been a lot of discussion about this in aesthetics and whether that, I mean, Cutting himself wants to say that that uh, leads to some form of anti-realist conclusions, people push back and so on. Um, but uh, what I've been, you know, we can talk about it, I, uh, but, but uh, what I want to emphasize about this is that most often when we are growing up, our exposure to works of art is not mere exposure. We, we, do, we do know what we want to do with that kind of uh, um, stimulus. It's not that we, we have this completely mere exposure, it's just an exposure to something that we have no, uh, we, 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 we're not doing anything with. Most of the time we encounter works of art, we encounter in a kind of context where we are, when we know what kind of experience we should be having. So either, you know, our parents take us to a museum or a friend show us some music that they like, then we, then we kind of, we have, a, we have some kind of pressure of, oh, well, this is, I, this is supposed to be good. I'm supposed to be feeling something here. So let's try to get that feeling. And I think that's a, that's a really important way in which uh, our taste level. So the second, the second kind of example I want to I want to talk about is about failed aesthetic experiences, and I, I wrote about this a, a little bit in, in earlier work. But uh, I think it's an important um, aspect of aesthetic experiences that they often fail. So very often we go to the museum and we sit down in front of our favorite painting. I mean, and I and you know we've had very strong aesthetic experiences in front of that painting before, but just today it's not. Not happening. There's nothing. Uh, you don't have any kind of positive experience. You're just, I don't know, looking at it, but nothing's happening. Um, is this something that resonates? I mean, maybe not with painting, but with music or something. So is this a piece of music that you really like and you play it today, and it's not um, not doing anything for you. So um, and on those occasions, 
we're uh, I, I I would say that we're really trying hard to uh, to not fail in that aesthetic experience, trying hard to to actually achieve something there. So that's another um, kind of salient example in which um, the, the kind of action, this kind of intentional effortful action that we uh, that we perform uh, during aesthetic engagement is uh, it's kind of it sh shows up a lot in our lives. Um, okay. So before we get carried away, I just want to make a, a, a um, kind of clarificatory remark about the scope of the claim. I'm not saying that in all aesthetic experience we have these kind of intentional actions. So I don't I don't want to say that this is a necessary feature of aesthetic experience. It's clearly not. Some of the sometimes we we have aesthetic experiences which just kind of really blow blow us away, and which is nothing we can do about it, and nothing we would do about it. So it's not it's not some kind of universal feature of aesthetic experience, but I think it's a really important feature. And so an analogy would be with uh, with emotional experiences. So in emotional experience, it's also not the case that all the time we have an emotional experience, we're trying to get that emotional experience. Sometimes emotions really just blow us away, right? You know, if you hear that that your grandmother died, you probably don't need to somehow work up your tears, right? So it's a you. But sometimes, and I think it's an important in order to understand emotional experiences in general, we need to take this kind of intentional action of trying to get the, uh, the emotional experience, the emotional regulation um, in, into consideration, or you have to take that seriously. And in the same way, when we talk about aesthetic experience, although that's not a necessary feature of aesthetic experience that we're sometimes trying to get it, uh, we need to understand that in order to have a full picture of what, um, of what uh, aesthetic experience is. So, so far, I ran the whole emotional experience and aesthetic experience stuff together. And I think there's a lot of really important and instructive analogies there in terms of how uh, we're um, really very often we're trying to have that kind of experience that we know we somehow should have. But I should say that there's also a really important disanalogy in the case of emotional experiences. We kind of know what it is that we're, uh, that we're going for. Uh, when, uh, when I'm in at the funeral and I feel that I should be feeling more sad than I am, that I know the, exactly the kind of experience I want to have. And because I've been sad before, I know exactly that that's the kind of emotional state I, I, want, I want to have. Whereas in the case of aesthetic experience, that's just not the case. We don't really know what it is that we're going for. And that's a really crucial aspect, I think, of, of the kind of action that's involved in, in aesthetic experience, that you're, there's an effortful, intentional, goal-directed action. But we don't really know what the goal is. It's a really special kind of action as a result. Uh, so yeah, so let's um, let's talk about what kind of action that is. So um, so we've seen that it's an effortful and goal-directed action. What what kind of action is it? So we can make this distinction between two different kinds of actions that I'm going to call trophy actions and process actions. And this is just a very general um, distinction that's not, you know, that can be made uh, not only in the aesthetic domain, it, it can be made about any kind of action. So there's certain actions that are such that if, um, and they, these are the ones that I call trophy actions, that there, if you're, if you don't reach the goal, it's a goal directed action, but if you don't reach the goal, you've just wasted your time. If you don't get the end result, then, um, then, it, then it doesn't make sense to do that action at all. So because of this, for these actions, it doesn't make sense to, to just do them a tiny little bit. You either do them all the way to the goal or you might as well not do it at all. So one example would be running the marathon or uh, I don't know, uh, getting tenure at a certain institution. It doesn't make sense to just do a little bit of it, right? Or it doesn't, it, if you don't get to the end then you're not, uh, then you're not, um, then it doesn't make sense, sense to do it. So th these are, I'm gonna call them trophy activities or trophy actions. And I wanna contrast this with process actions, which is just the opposite. So it's, it's, it's actions that you do. Uh, again, these are goal-directed actions, but, uh, but it's okay not to reach the goal, right? So if, even if you don't reach the goal, it does make sense to do it. So for these actions, it makes sense to do it just a little bit. You don't have to like do all the way to completion. And an example here that I would wanna contrast with running the marathon would be walking along the beach. Uh, so, okay, so this is a very general distinction between trophy and process action. So which one is, uh, which one would be um, the kind of action that's involved in aesthetic engagement? 
But you might think it's process action. I think it's not like that. But before that, so so you have you can have this kind of spiel, and I did this in one of those popular writings uh, that I mentioned in the introduction about somehow uh, how you have to keep a trophy process balance, and uh, that's more important than a work life balance because even if work life balance is kind of silly anyway, and and in the life part of the work life balance, you still do a lot of pros do a lot of trophy activities. Um, but I don't, you know, this is not, uh, I, that's not the kind of um, message I want to uh, give you here. Uh, but what I, what, what I find that's really important here is that the kind of action that's involved in aesthetic experience is neither a trophy or nor a process action. It's not a, uh, a trophy action because it's, um, because it's very much okay not to reach the goal, right? It makes a lot of sense to do this kind of action, even if, if just a little bit. And it's not, so in that sense, it's like a, like a process activity. And it's not like, but it's not really like a process activity uh, in as much as in the case of a, uh, a process activity, you're not really try, trying to reach the goal. You're just, uh, you have a goal directed action, you do it a little bit, but you know, the goal is not that important. Whereas in the case of uh, the aesthetic action that's involved in the um, in aesthetic experience, the goal is important, but, uh, but it's okay not to reach it. So it's, it's somewhere in between, it's some kind of mix and match. So it's, it's um, you're trying to reach the goal. So it's like a trophy activity like this, but it's okay not to reach the goal. So it's like a process activity. And, and I think what, what explains this kind of in between um, status of, the, uh, of, of these actions is that what's happening in aesthetic engagement is that you're trying to reach the goal. You're trying to have an aesthetic experience but you don't really know what that experience, aesthetic experience is gonna be like. So that's the, uh, that's the main kind of distinguishing feature of this action. Now, the title of the talk was um, Aesthetic Experiences Achievement. And I have a, kind of mixed feelings about that label, partly because after I came up with this uh, cool title, I, I actually looked and there's a lot of philosophy of achievement apparently. So there's a, there's a book called Achievement. Um, by Gwen Bradford, it's a brilliant ordinary language analysis of the word achievement. And uh, this is where I'm going to rant about ordinary language philosophy, which I think is the most pointless thing you can possibly do in your life. Uh, but okay, that's probably enough for, for the rant. Um, why? Because mainly ordinary language analysis is, is about English language. Um, that's not gonna be, and I don't know how achievement comes out in other languages, uh, than English, I, mean, I know some of some languages, for example, in my native language, uh, which is Hungarian, uh, achievement would come out as teljesítmény, which frankly is, has very different connotation from the word uh, achievement. So I'm not sure how, and also I'm, I'm just, what, what would be the odds that the word that we use for a phenomenon is going to like fully elucidate what the phenomenon is? So, all right, rent over. Uh, but what, what I want to get, what I want to take away from this whole, um, whole analysis of, um, of achievement, which is again, this is an extremely sensitive and nice, a nice analysis that, um, that was given by uh, Gwen Bradford. But uh, she, she thinks that there are two necessary conditions on achievement and I wanna question both of them. One of them is that it's difficult. So something is not an achievement unless it's difficult. And the other one is that in order for something to count as an achievement, there's some competence is required, some kind of, it needs to be a competent achieving of a goal. So pure luck is, is ruled out. So, um, and I want to, instead of kind of giving you counter examples, I just gonna want to give you quotes by, um, by great musicians, <laughs> Frederick Chopin and Rita Ora, uh, just to show you that I'm not an elitist snob. Um, so, so yeah, you can read the you can read the quotes, and you know, I'm, again, I don't particularly want to engage with the whole kind of let's give a necessary not sufficient condition for a meaning of a word that clearly does not have necessary sufficient conditions. But what I want to take away from this is that I think that uh, while I don't think that this, these are going to be strict necessary conditions that an, an achievement should be difficult and that uh, that some competence is required. Uh, I want to say that some achievement is not difficult at all, and some achievements, uh, the competence is very um, dubious. But what is clear, what I want to, what, what I, the sense in which I want to use the term achievement is this kind of very minimal sense in which achievement, what is true, what is definitely, what is for sure true about achievement is that it takes effort. 
uh, achievement is something that is an that is effortful. If you if you if it doesn't take effort, then it's not really going to be much of an achievement. And it also needs some kind of idea of what it is that we're doing. Well, that's that's all that I'm going to assume about the term achievement. Um, just to, good. And uh, and I want to kind of distinguish my my view about uh, aesthetic experience as achievement between two seemingly close view and one of them is by Nelson Goodman so he he writes this in the language of art that you might think is wow this sounds very much like what I'm saying that's what I thought and I got very excited um, so so he says the aesthetic attitude is restless searching testing uh, is less an attitude than an action creation and recreation um, so that sounds that sounds very similar to what I'm trying to do so so you know I get hopeful but unfortunately that does not seem like that's what that what he has in mind is really what I have in mind because in uh, later, like, uh, 15 years later, he, when he's elaborating on this idea, he says that coming to understand a painting or a symphony in an unfamiliar style, to, to recognize the work of an artist or school, to see or hear in new ways is as cognitive an achievement as learning to read or write or add. So the reason why I mentioned uh, Goodman is not just to show you that, you know, that, um, here is a view in the vicinity, but also I think it's an important contrast because Goodman wants to think of this kind of achievement or the kind of action that's involved in, um, in aesthetic engagement as a cognitive action. It's something intellectual, something that you, uh, that you, that, that, uh, that is done in the kind of uh, higher cognitive parts of your uh, mind. And that's really not what I'm trying to say. I think the kind of achievement, I mean, that can be the case, that can, that can be involved, but that's really not, in typical cases, that's not the kind of achievement that I have in mind. That's not the kind of action that you're doing while you're um, while you're engaging uh, with with an artwork. Very often, it's very simple actions, kind of perceptual actions, attending to this, attending to that. So, yeah. um, the other product differentiation I, I, I want to give is is with the idea that is very old idea going back to Ovid, uh, who says there is no worth in that which is not a difficult achievement. But this is also just uh, including in this book on achievement that I, I mentioned before, there's a, a general kind of pro tanto relation between, you know, the more difficult an achievement is, the more we value it. Um, and I just don't, again, I don't think that that's the case. And I, and I don't think that somehow, um, that somehow aesthetic experience is better because the action involved is more difficult. So it's not the case that you know Stockhausen, in, in, you know, uh, enjoying a Stockhausen piece is by definition going to be more of an aesthetic experience than enjoying a I don't know what would be a simple piece of work, of musical work, um, whatever. Pick, pick your uh, simple I don't know Haydn, I guess, uh, than be than enjoying a Haydn um, Haydn quartet, which actually is pretty difficult. So. Well, pick your pick your pick your not so difficult thing. So it's not about difficult. It's not about just how difficult your uh, um, the level of difficulty in in achieving that. So that's again, I just wanted to uh, to to make it clear that that's not what I'm saying. So I'm not. It's, I'm not saying like uh, now. Some Goodman is saying that it's a cognitive achievement, and I'm not saying that it's all about the, the difficult. And this is uh, this. This could also count as a product differentiation. Although I think it's, uh, I think of this as more uh, uh, looking ahead and trying to characterize um, the kind of um, action that I'm interested in here in a more precise work. So uh, there's been an influential book uh, by T about the games, which has a lot of really interesting and important implications for um, for um, for aesthetics. So so the distinction here is between achievement play, and it's not a very helpful label for my purposes, but let's go with it for now. Uh, these are his terms. Achievement play versus striving play. So the idea is that when you play a game, there's two ways we can play, play a game. Uh, the achievement play is when you uh, fix the end and you choose the most efficient means to get to the end. And the striving play is kind of the, the opposite of that. Uh, you, you don't fix the end, you choose the end on the basis of what kind of means you're enjoying. And basically, the, the end is going to only serve as an excuse for uh, to justify the means. So the achievement play is when the means is justified by the end, and the striving play is when the end is justified by the means in some sense. 
So you might think, and that's exactly what T is thinking, that aesthetic engagement is a, is a prime example of striving play, but I just, I don't think so. I think it's a, it's a, it's a third way of um, this kind of means ends relation. So it's not the case that in aesthetic engagements, we, um, we choose the end on the basis of what kind of means we're enjoying the most. What happens in, uh, in aesthetic engagement is some kind of flipping back and forth between these two things. So you, for you, fix the end, fix the end, in, in which case, you know, what kind of aesthetic experience you think you're going to get out of this. And then you choose the means to get there. And then depending on what kind of means you're using there, you adjust the end. And on the basis of that, you adjust the means. And then you adjust the end again, you adjust the means again, and so on. So there's this kind of um, um, interesting back and forth there. Um, so it's, some, it's not really a, um, it's not striving play at all. It's some kind of uh, switching back and forth between achievement play and, and striving play. And that really kind of emphasized, and this is where I really wanted to get out of this, this example or this comparison, uh, that the, the really important feature of, of this action is that it's not, it's an action, but it's an interaction with the object. So um, this, this general structure of, um, of the mean, of the relation between the means and the ends, namely that you're, it's not the case that you fix the end, for good, and then you're just gonna go with the most efficient means or fix the means for good, because that's what you're enjoying. And then you find an end that will justify the mean. What's happening is some kind of adjust, the continuous adjusting of one to the other and then the other to the one. Uh, that makes this an interaction, not an action per se, but an interaction with the object, with the aesthetic object that you're engaging with. And it is very much like a lot of activities that we care about a lot. It's very much like a conversation with someone where the same thing is, seems to be happening, right? You're, um, it, there's a kind of a back and forth, there's a kind of a mutual, two, the two things are sensitive to each other, the, the means and the ends are sensitive to, to each other. Same thing is going with, with friendship and to use the, an example that's been used a lot uh, as a comparison for aesthetic experience recently, love. And that's, uh, that's gonna get to, to another kind of recently influential way in which people think about the aesthetic domain recently, namely that somehow one important aspect of aesthetics is that it's really crucially important for the self, for our sense of self. And then there's been the diverging views about why, why that is or how, how to explain that. And here I, um, I, I need to somehow make, a, um, make another clarifying remark. Uh, I've been emphasizing the importance of the activity or things that we do, things that we have control over with aesthetic experience, right? So the, if it is the case that while we're very aesthetically engaging with something, we're actively trying to do something that really emphasizes the control over this kind of experience. But I should make it clear that we do not have full control. It's not fully up to us. And remember that example that I, uh, that I started out with when about failed aesthetic experiences where we just, uh, we're really trying to have an aesthetic experience, but it's not happening. So because of this, um, I think it's fair to describe the, the aesthetic engagement is, some, is not just an interaction, it's a two-way interaction between the object and, and you and the subject. Uh, and that is what makes this action very, um, very special. So most of the, uh, the, the kind of action that's involved in this experience is very, uh, very special. In most experiences, uh, we don't get this kind of two-way interaction. So uh, remember the experience, the, the contrast case I started out with the experience of red. When you see a red color, there is no back and forth. There's no two-way interaction between the, the object and you. The same with tooth, toothache as well. These are kind of one-way experiences. But I think what's one, something that, one thing that's really important and, and underrated about aesthetic experiences is, is it's this kind of two-way interaction between the object and you. And again, just to, to throw in yet another uh, analogy here, it's a little bit like dancing with someone. So when you're dancing with someone, it's not the case that you're, so you would have to be sensitive to what, the, what your dance partner is doing. And then depending on what your dance partner is doing, you adjust your mood. And then on the basis of how you adjust your mood, your dance partner is gonna do something else and so on and so on. So you have an action and it gets a reaction and an action, reaction, action, reaction. So that's the, that's the general uh, structure of the of this action or other interaction that's in that's involved here and that uh, i think that really crucial and central feature of of this action that's in, of what i call achievement 
the action that's involved in, uh, in aesthetic experience. It explains many of the, the things that I talked about um, earlier. Um, I'm not gonna go back now. Um, good, now I should, I should say that on the basis of what I remember from uh, Heidegger, I, I find it possible that that's what he might have talked about with the earth and all that stuff and fungal groups, but who am I to tell? Okay, so, uh, so I want to talk about two important consequences of this view. I guess the self was one consequence, but two more important consequences for this view. One of them is for the social aspect of aesthetics. And that's, exact, that's again, kind of a, an important and influential um, line of argument these days in, in contemporary aesthetics. People tend to uh, emphasize the social dimension of, uh, of aesthetics more. Um, by the way, I should ask, how, how long do I have to give this talk? Do I have 45 minutes or an hour or what's the, you're muted. Uh, yeah, one hour, oh. one hour you have. A... Okay, cool. Well, I'll be done a little earlier. Um, if it's a, some more, more questions, which is always that. So, um, right. So, so, so people have been emphasizing the social aspect of, of aesthetics and, um, but in analytic aesthetics, a, uh, the most, influential way in which the social dimension of, of aesthetics made its appearance is in terms of uh, explaining aesthetic agreements and disagreements. And I want to emphasize, uh, and I did, did some in earlier work as well, that although that's of course an important aspect in which um, we share, uh, you know, to, to figure out what we are agreeing and disagreeing about in the aesthetic domain that can be an important thing in our social interactions with others. It can make us feel closer to someone or less close. What we really care about is not really the aesthetic this, and, and agreement and disagreement, but rather having aesthetic experiences together. Uh, you know, go to, the, go to a concert together, listen to the music, uh, listen to a musical piece together, watching a film together and so on, looking at the painting together. Uh, whether we agree on it or not, is kind of a very coarse grained uh, and Kind of pale imitation to the kind of closeness that the closeness experience that, that having an aesthetic experience together can bring. And I think we can, we can understand why this kind of shared aesthetic experiences or having aesthetic experiences together are, um, are so important or why we, why, we, why, why we find that so crucial in, uh, in, uh, in understanding our um, social interactions with each other. And that's and that's kind of follows from what I said before. If aesthetic experience is achievement, is, an, is, an, is the kind of action that I talked about so far, this kind of achievement that's an interaction with the object and so on, then uh, shared aesthetic experience is a joint achievement. And of course, joint achievement is something that very much brings people together. Uh, just look at the people celebrating the goals after, the, after they scored a goal into Euro 2020. So that is the real social glue. Um, so I don't think that aesthetic agreements and disagreements really bring you, bring you a very strong kind of social glue. It gives you a pale substitute, I think. Um, we can talk about this, but I'm, I'm, or not, nothing really depends on this for the purposes of this talk. But what I really care about for the purposes of this talk is that what makes uh, for a really um, important social glue is the kind of important bond between any two people is this kind of joint achievement that's brought about by having to uh, having aesthetic experiences together. Okay, and the last thing, it's in case you thought that I'm not gonna talk about global aesthetics, um, uh, which is my, so that's my big next project that, I, that this is a part of, uh, this talk is gonna be a part of. So I, I, this is also gonna go in the direction of global aesthetics. So here's the thing about um, this kind of actions that you perform in aesthetic experiences. It's very much learned. You learn the kind of actions that you do in order to get to an aesthetic experience from your peers and from your parents and from your, from your friends. And because of this, um, there's, this, this is one of the things that, one of the many things that explains the interpersonal variations in aesthetic experience. There are huge interpersonal variations in aesthetic experience. There's also huge intrapersonal variations. You know, you can have aesthetic experience of the very same object today and none of that tomorrow. But there's also just huge interpersonal variations. Two people looking at the same object, same lighting conditions could have very different kind of aesthetic experiences or aesthetic experience or the like thereof and so on. But 
part of what explains these interpersonal variations, and I've began, I've been talking about, I've been talking about this in very different terms in earlier work about how tension, of course, makes a difference in experience. And of course, if you're attending differently, then, you, then your experience is going to be different. But what I want to emphasize today is that there are going to be these variations because there are variations in how it is that you're trying to achieve the aesthetic experience and also what kind of aesthetic experience you're trying to achieve. So the difference in the action that you're performing during aesthetic engagement is what explains the variation in aesthetic experience. And again, that's because you, you learn, you know, you and I learn very different ways and very different kind of actions that we're trying to use in order to, to get the aesthetic experience. And this is where we get, when it gets to the global stuff, um, there, um, there are also cultural differences in aesthetic experience. And there's a nice literature on that. And again, um, one thing, the question is what explains that? And what I want to emphasize today, I'm going to give you other explanations in a second, but I want to emphasize today is that again, there are these cultural differences because there are cultural differences in the actions that you use, in what we are trying to do to achieve the aesthetic experience. So just to go back to, to uh, kind of a, to step back and, and kind of try to think about uh, the globalness of aesthetics, um, one important thing I think that as aestheticians who are mainly, I think in this room, in this virtual room, are working in the Western tradition, um, are trying to explain when, we, when we're doing aesthetics, is that it's a really important thing that we should, we should not assume and we cannot assume that just because I have a certain kind of experience of an object, this is the kind of experience that everyone else is gonna have. So just because I go to the Louvre and look at the Mona Lisa and have a certain kind of aesthetic experience, I should not be assuming that that's the kind of experience I, I, that, that everyone else is gonna have. And the same is true if I'm going to the, to the uh, not to the Louvre, but to the, uh, uh, the Musée de l'Homme, or whatever it's the, the called the, the new Musée de l'Homme, and look at an artifact from uh, Oceania. And the kind of experience that I have is not gonna be the kind of experience that other people have from other cultural backgrounds, including the cultural backgrounds of Oceania. And that's a, I think that's a, just a really important thing to, that aesthetics should be, should be, um, should be attending to. Uh, and I have, then it hasn't really. And the reason for that, some of the reason for that is that, uh, as, that aesthetics, and that's the kind of big accusation if you talk, talk a lot to art historians, they're going to, and you tell them that you're an aesthetician, they're going to accuse you of being a cultural universalist because that's, what they think that aesthetics is doing is to look for these universals, these aesthetic universals, that kind of uh, paper over all these cultural differences. And it is true to some traditions in aesthetics, it's definitely true for, uh, funnily enough, to the kind of more empiric, empirical uses of aesthetics and kind of neuroaesthetics. Uh, they really just you know, put you in a scanner and show, show you images and make you rate them regardless of, um, cultural differences. But what, of course, our historians, they are in a completely different game. What they really want to know about is the cultural variations. So, uh, but what I want to say is that it's not, um, if we are take, taking the empirical stuff seriously, uh, which I do in my other life as a philosopher of perception, um, then that should really push us away from cultural universalism and towards cultural variations. And the reason for that is a top-down influence on perception. So um, I'm just gonna be very brief, so don't worry if that's uh, intimidating. So the, the way the visual system works is that there's a uh, light hits your retina and then, um, and then the input goes to the uh, GN and then the primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, uh, V4, and then up to IT. Um, but it's not the full story. There's also, there's not just this feed forward kind of bottom up mechanism, there's also top down mechanism. There's a lot of kind of uh, feedback mechanisms that go from higher levels of perceptual processing to, uh, to lower level of perceptual processing. And that's gonna have uh, important implications for, for all this stuff. So if you look at this picture, you probably don't know what it depicts, unless you've seen me this talk before. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and the researchers worked hard to hide what, what it depicts, but this is what it depicts, right? And then if you look at it again, if you look at the same picture again, you're gonna have a very different experience. It's not only that you're gonna have a very different experience, your visual system works very differently after you've seen this. 
So um, just to give you a very short account. So do you see the, the line that the girl's nose um, corresponds to? There's no line here on this black and white picture, on this bitonal picture. And because of this, before you've seen the, black, the, the color picture, the neurons in your, in your prime visual cortex did nothing that were there. But after you've seen it, the direction sensitive neurons that are, uh, that are corresponding to the, for, to, the, to the contour of the nose, they're firing away like crazy. So that's a kind of a nice illustration of how top-down influence of perception work. Um, now what I, what I want, what I, and this is something that I've emphasized before, um, what I, the takeaway from this, I think, is that um, because of this, because your vision really depends on the kind of things that you've seen before, because of this, the, the kind of both linear and line about uh, the history of vision actually does make some kind of sense. Uh, so so Wolflin famously said, vision itself has its history and, and the revelation of these visual strata is the primary task of art, art history. And, uh, and we can make, given that there are kind of these different people in different parts of history, they've seen different visual stimuli. And then as a result, they've seen what they saw differently. Um, and, and, but we can make this, uh, this claim, not about history, but about geography of, so we can talk this with the geography of vision. So different people in different parts of the world, they were exposed to very different kind of stimuli. And as a result, when they look at the same thing now, they're gonna have very different experiences because of the top-down influences of perception. I'm gonna skip this. Um, and I want to just talk about two important uh, determinants of why these kind of top-down influences are important in the aesthetic domain. So the general line of argument here is that top-down influences cha change the way um, we see an artwork, a visual art, I don't say visual artwork here, but it's also true for other art, art forms. And, the, and there's two kind of determinants of that, attention and mental imagery. So top-down influences change um, our attention and our mental imagery, and that's what's going to change our experience. And as a result of this, uh, there's gonna, we can expect cross-cultural variations in attention, in mental imagery, and that's what's gonna explain why our experience of, um, of artworks is going to be, or our aesthetic experience in general, would be different in different cultural, in different cultural backgrounds. Uh, I'm just gonna say something very, sim very simple about attention and, uh, and mental imagery before I get back to the whole action stuff that I started out with. So this is, a, uh, this is an artifact from Oceania, from the Solomon Islands. Um, and when you look at it, uh, you might think it's uh, like a nice abstract pendant, um, but um, I can tell you that um, if you look at the bottom of it, it normally works better if I can actually point at things. I can't really do that here. Can I? Can you see my cursor? You can't see my cursor? Yes. You can't see my cursor? Yes, yes. Okay, cool. So this apparently is, so, it's, so this is the Solomon Island. It's a, it's a very tiny island that where they make these things. And they, what they do, what they depend on is fishing. And uh, the way they can tell whether they're fish or not is this, this kind of bird that flies over the fish. And that's how they know how, where to get fish. And that bird is depicted, that, that is that bird. And these are fish, little dolphin-like looking things. So this little uh, hump. So after I told you this, you can have the same kind of things that I had here, this before, after, as a result of um, top-down information. Uh, before I told you all this, these little humps probably did not make that much of a, a difference in your perceptual experience. After I told you that these are the humps of dolphins, they might have made a more important uh, distinction. So you're going to attend to different features given the kind of background information you have as a result of top-down influences. And given that attention has a fam famously a very uh, important influence on ex experience, that's part of what explains the difference in experience. So I talked about how um, what you're attending to makes a difference, but also the way you're attending to also makes a difference. So this is a kind of uh, famous eye-tracking study about uh, experts and non-experts, art experts and art novices, about how, where are they looking when they're looking at a, at a, uh, at a picture. So the, so the column in the middle is the way novices look. So they basically just kind of focus their attention on the, on, on the main features, like the figure here on the face here. Whereas people with some kind of art historical training, they, more, they have a more distributed 
thing going on. And that also makes a big difference for, uh, for the experience, not just what you're attending to, but also the way you're attending to it. Next one is mental imagery. So mental imagery also has an important uh, role to play in, uh, in our engagement with, um, with art. And I'm gonna focus on visual art because it's easier to show. And again, as imagery also depends on top-down influences, our experience is also gonna depend on top-down influences. And given that the top-down influences are different in different cultures, uh, gonna, that's gonna be a mediator of um, these cross-cultural differences. So this is the first shot of the Buster Keaton film, Cops. So you go to the cinema, you buy a ticket to a film that, that is called Cops. And then this is, this, this is the first uh, image that you see. So you're probably gonna think, well, uh, Buster is behind bars, he's, he's, uh, he's in the prison. Well, he's not, he's just behind a, a gate. And the reason why he's, uh, he has this kind of sad face is because that's, that's just the face he has, I guess. And also his, uh, his girlfriend just broke up with him. So again, there's this, your expectations, the story of that influence is that they're very much influencing the general experience that you have. And it's gonna be very culturally sensitive if you don't know that in the 20s, early 20s, early 1920s, you, um, you know, that's the kind of bars that you had in prisons and it's not gonna really uh, work for you, this joke. And this is a, a work of a contemporary Indonesian artist, uh, very much uh, relies on the mental imagery that you have of horses here. But the important kind of culturally sensitive issue here is that in Indonesian cultures, horses are very much connected to oppression because basically the only horses, the horses were only used by military. You probably don't have that connotation. So you're going to have a very different kind of experience, a very different kind of mental imagery here. And as a result, you can have a very different kind of uh, experience here. So that's again, kind of one way in which you can explain why there are cultural um, differences in aesthetic experience as a result of the cultural background mediated by attention and mental imagery. So because of all this, because there are all these cross-cultural variations in attention and mental imagery, there are gonna be cross-cultural variations in our engagement with that. So universe is a non-option. But just to kind of bring all of the stuff about achievement that we talked about together, uh, uh, talked about earlier today. Um, we could, there's a third reason, or I don't know, like an, an extra reason, a really important reason for these cross-cultural variations in aesthetic engagement, namely the cross-cultural variations of what we do, of, what, of how we are trying to achieve the kind of ex experience and what it is that we're trying to achieve. So because of this, aesthetic universalism is even less of an option. So really global aesthetics is the only way to go. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vence. And now we have time for questions. You can uh, write question if you have one. So I can see first uh, Alessandro, Alessandro Bertinetto, please. Alessandro, can you unmute yourself? Now you can do it, Alessandro. So. Oh, apparently you have to activate their audio. Maybe they're automatically muted. Uh, so you have to unmute them. Maybe I can do it. I can, oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, oh, there, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I just muted you. Um, okay. okay, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Ah, okay, wonderful. Thank you, Benson. Thank you. Uh, it was great. Um, it was very useful also for for, my, for the talk that uh, I will give here, and, for, and I think it is it is a very much a lot of connection with a paper that uh, I wrote together with Adam and the Chesky, So I'm very uh, excited about your uh, uh, talk today. I I, I agree with uh, um, uh, all what you say actually, but uh, I have I have um, a question concerning. Uh, a topic, a traditional topic in aesthetics, which is the idea, uh, traditional idea that uh, the aesthetic experience uh, has to do with, uh, uh, is a Kantian idea actually, with favor, okay, with uh, 
the je ne sais quoi. So with something that uh, is not directly connected uh, 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 apparently with uh, uh, achievement, okay? The idea of uh, the aesthetic experience is something uh, which is uh, just which is a, a kind of gratuitousness uh, in it, okay? So it happens without uh, uh, apparently being the result of an achievement. So can you accommodate this or, or, or would you like to accommodate this in your picture or uh, uh, you are not interested in, in, in this, uh, you are against this view, et cetera? Thank you. No, good. So I, uh, I actually think that that kind of falls out of my stuff, I mean, at least I hope so. So um, once again, the achievement is not, you know, the, whatever you're doing while you're trying to achieve an aesthetic experience is not going to guarantee the aesthetic experience partly because you don't know what it is that you're achieving. Right? I mean, that's, that's a je ne sais quoi right there. You don't know what it is, what it's going to be. And, and you're, uh, you're trying stuff. And then sometimes the work of art responds in some ways. That's kind of a metaphorical talk. Sometimes it doesn't. And you're, you have this kind of elaborate dance. But it's, the, it's part, of the, part of what makes this kind of action more kind of special or, more, uh, or, or different from any, any kind of other actions is because you don't, don't know what you're going for. Um, so, and that was the big contrast with the emotional experience that in some sense it's similar, the emotional regulation in some sense is, it's similar, but in emotional regulation, I, you know, I want to feel uh, happy or sad, I know exactly what I'm going for, but in aesthetic experience you have no idea, you know that it's somehow, it's in that direct, that general vague direction, but it's not, it's just, it's a very, uh, there's a margin of indefiniteness there that is built into the whole action. So that's the hope that I can I can at least try to explain that uh, this is your initial quest. Exactly, it's unexpected. Okay, uh, Elisa Caldarola, I think she's not in the room now. So let's go to Martin Essenhagen. Can you unmute him? <laughs> oh yes, now I can do it myself. That's good. Okay. Hi, Benze. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have a question about um, uh, the relation between the, the achievement and the aesthetic pleasure or aesthetic value or just the aesthetic more generally. Because you could think, because um, you want to say that some aesthetic experiences are achievements in that sense. You don't want to commit yourself to the stronger claim that all are. And then I could uh, make another observation is that some aesthetic experiences are had on Sunday um, and not all are had on Sunday but you could think that there is no clear relation between being had on Sunday and the aesthetic this is just it happens to be on Sunday um, whereas it seemed to me that you wanted to say even though you don't want to say the, the stronger claim that all aesthetic experiences are achievements um, that nonetheless, when aesthetic experiences are achievements, there is an important, interesting philosophical connection between the achievement and the aesthetic. Uh, so it could be something like it explains why we think of this experience as aesthetically valuable, or um, maybe the achievement itself is the object of the aesthetic experience or part of the, the objects or the properties that we aesthetically appreciate. I was just curious what, uh, what, what, what you think about that, what, what directions you want to take to say a little bit more about that connection. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, the, it is different from the ex experience you have on Sunday, of course, in the case of religious experience, that might be a different connection. Uh, there is. Um, so yeah, so um, so it's so first of all, I want to say so. I, I again, I want to allow for aesthetic experiences to have nothing to do with achievement, or nothing to do with any action that you do, and I think that these are kind of important um, examples of aesthetic experience. But I think that the uh, certain tradition in Western analytic aesthetics has been focusing basically exclusively on those kind of aesthetic experiences where we're just, but it's just treat you and that's it. Uh, and I just think that the vast majority of the aesthetic experiences that we have are not like that. It sometimes does happen. And, you know, if you kind of think back to your, uh, you know, the big memorable aesthetic experiences that you had in your life, probably many of them are going to be like this. But most of the time, when, you're, when you have an aesthetic experience, you have to work on it. So I guess that's kind of the take home message. This aesthetic experiences often take, very often, most often, almost always, 
take some work. Um, and, um, and even if you do have the kind of, you know, wave crashing over you, it just kind of blows you away stuff. Even in those cases, in order to maintain that aesthetic experience, you will have to, uh, to, to, to do something, to, to, to do this action. So I would, I would like to say that it's, uh, I mean, again, I don't think that's a necessary feature, but it's a kind of, uh, and a, a really important feature of almost in the of the vast majority of aesthetic experiences we have. Does this help? It does. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, um, Irene. Irene Martinez Marin. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Vincent. I, I really uh, enjoyed that. I just want to ask you a question uh, as a clarificatory question. Uh, so sometimes um, it seems that the claim is that, well, that aesthetic experience is achievement. In others, but then other times it seems that the claim is that if you do certain actions, um, that will lead you uh, to a aesthetic experience. It seems more like an enabler and not just uh, just an analogy or identity claim. Um, so I was just wondering if what you think in that if you do certain things, then how do you understand the goal? Is the goal the experience in itself? Because if we make the analogy with the T1, T1 picture, for him the goal is to have correct judgments. And but here we're not talking about judgments, but we're talking about experiences. So it's just how to understand um, this. And also, if I if you could say a bit more of why are you talking about um, intentional action, and if there's no goal, I, if you think that there's not like a clear goal to reach, why not just talk about voluntary action? Because, for example, in, in philosophy of action, it's I mean it's it's quite popular to say that, um, and intentional action there has to be a reason that explains the action. I mean the the subject has a reason to do something, but it seems that here that there's not a clear reason, or maybe the reason is just to have an experience in general without really knowing what's going to happen. Uh, but maybe you could save that by just saying that it's just voluntary, in, but not maybe intentional. Good. So there's more like, like three questions here with all of them yeah. very uh, helpful. Let me start with the last one. Um, so in, I, I do think that it's a goal-directed action. And in that sense, it's an intentional action, but uh, the goal is very vague. So think of mm -hmm. uh, you know J James Bond, the end of Goldfinger, trying to take apart the bomb. No idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's a very vague, like a generally characterized bomb goal of of uh, disabling the bomb, but there's no kind of specific goal that he had because he had no idea how to do it. So in some sense, we have a kind of similar situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some sense, in, in an even less, there's a kind of very clear for James on what is the, what would be a good end result and what would be a bad end result. And I think that we're even a little less epistemically uh, lucky situation. We, really, we have a fairly vague goal when, we, mm -hmm. when we're going for an aesthetic experience, but that doesn't mean that it can be a goal directed action, right? Mm -hmm. The goal can be specified more or, or, or less narrowly. So I do want to say that it's intentional action. Uh, I, I'm sidelined, but I also don't think that intentional action has anything to do with reasons. But, mm -hmm. um, it's a different question. Um, but the, uh, and your previous question, that had a lot to do with Martin's, uh, Martin's question, I think. So then the question is this then, is, it, is this constitutive? So, so I, I didn't, I kind of stayed away from that because I, I don't know, I always find, get, get into trouble when I talk about constitutive <laughs> things. So, um, so, so, so is it the case that at least in those occasions of aesthetic experience when the action is involved, is the action constitutive of the experience or is it just some kind of uh, causal antecedent of that? Mm -hmm. And I mean, part of me wants to say it is constitutive and, and I think that the whole interaction stuff is, uh, is a reason to think that it is constitutive, right? I mean, it is part of what aesthetic experience is that, you know, you're doing, you're trying this and then the work of art is nothing. And you try this and the work of art somehow resonates with what you're doing and so on. You go back and forth. So I, um, so I do want to say that, but I'm not sure that I really have like the rock solid arguments to make the constitutive claim because that's, you know, constitutive claims are difficult to make. But that's the direction I want to go. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, um, Pauline from Monsdorf. Yes, thank you for a very stimulating talk. Um, my question is uh, uh, how far you think that your 
um, your discussion of, of aesthetic experience can uh, be uh, extended to the making of art. And the reason I ask this is that I've been uh, playing with the idea of aesthetic practices myself and, and aesthetic practices is of course, it gives a kind of a temporal perspective on aesthetic experience, which are some, somehow uh, often discussed as, as individual experiences. Excellent. So, um, I mean, I actually think that the point you're raising. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Sorry. I, I, I was. I was just going to say that this is also often for some people also comes with with doing, with doing art. So, so um, yeah. So well. So, so yeah. That was basically my question. Please. Great. So, so I think that the whole temporal dimension. This is something that I meant to emphasize. But this this is another aspect in which I think that the uh, the rich drawn aesthetic experience have been um, not very helpful in the sense that when they when they talked about when you talk about aesthetic experience, it's this kind of momentary thing of just thing hitting you. But that's not that's not the way any of our experiences are. All our experiences they take time. They have a temporal thickness. And aesthetic experience, in the case of aesthetic experience, this temporal thickness is actually really important and meaningful. And and that's because that this temporal thickness is explained by how you know you're trying to do something and the work of art is doing something and so on. This whole interaction thing, this two way dance. Uh, stuff now with the, with the creating of the work of art. So um, so the way I'm trying, I don't know how to say this. So I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm interested in those aspects of aesthetics. That's about the consumer and the artwork. Um, I, I find I find it difficult to uh, I mean the, to talk about um, to talk about the creation of creation of artworks. Um, because I'm not really creating artworks, whereas I'm uh, reacting to artworks more often. So I have less of a personal experience there. But I think if, if it works for, and, and it's got to be the case that, you know, when artists, they create an artwork, they are paying attention to how, what they're creating, what kind of experience that, uh, that gives them. So, uh, so if, if this, can be, uh, this can be applied to the creation part, that would be, that would be very good. I just feel I don't really have the, the expertise and the background to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jakub, stay skull. Jakub? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I think uh, Eliza should be the one asking the question. I think she's back online. Who? Is Me. That so? <laughs> yeah, Elisa, because you were. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Sorry, we had a blackout here. So I hope nobody has already uh, asked this question since I couldn't listen before. Um, I'd like uh, some clarification about, about what you said um, concerning aesthetic experience as a kind of social glue, because there are forms of, uh, of engagement uh, with, uh, with artworks, for instance, that uh, Yes, like going to a concert is something we, uh, we can do together. We prefer to do it together. And I, uh, I do understand your point. But when it comes to, I don't know, reading a novel, for instance, I find it a bit more difficult to understand uh, why it is that, that uh, I should think that uh, reading it together in some sense of together should be more important to me than agreeing or disagreeing on, on a its uh, aesthetic value or properties. Sure, uh, no, that's a good, that's a fair point. And I, uh, I mean, this is again, I, I don't, for the purposes of this talk, I could just say that, yeah, agreement, aesthetic agreement, disagreement, super important, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I could just say that um, and then we'd be done. But I do think that the, uh, that it's sharing an aesthetic experience is way more important. And when, for example, when, when two people, uh, they both like the same book, what they enjoy about that agreement is not that, oh, do you like Ulysses? Yeah, I do, great. Uh, that's not it. The, what, it's, what it's about is that you're, you're, fo you're kind of focusing on attending to certain parts and say that, well, look how uh, interestingly, Jeff, you know, at the end of the book, there's this theme that comes back that was there in the, in the middle and in the first. So, so you have this kind of vicarious experience of kind of reliving certain things that you've read and you do that together. 
And that is, that is what brings it together, not just Ulysses, check. So I think that each, each time when you look, when you pay attention to what it is that, that we're enjoying about aesthetic agreement, it's not the, you know, uh, the, the same books are in the same column of the like or dislike. It's about somehow reliving a certain experience together. Am I allowed a short reply? Yes, please. Elisa. Thanks. But I always thought that, yeah, aesthetic agreement or disagreement can be of the yes and not kind about the general uh, value we want to attribute to a certain object, but it can also be about the attribution of specific properties, right? Can't it? And, and, and then it gets Attribution more complicated properties. because then we are discussing about, about those more complex aspects of, for instance, a novel that are the aspects that make it interesting for us to, to, to read it, to experience it. So your, your internet cut out, or maybe mine did, uh, you oh. said the appreciation of something, something properties. Did you say aesthetic properties? Um, so you said, well, uh, you don't read the novel and uh, talk about uh, it uh, with someone else uh, just for uh, the sake of, of uh, hearing whether they like it or not. And I agree with you on this, but I think that uh, we want to discuss whether someone else agrees on the fact that the novel has um, a certain property because it is structured in a certain way, for instance. We want to, to discuss more fine-grained properties. And that is a matter of aesthetic agreement or disagreement, I think. So it, 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 it has to do with our more fine-grained engagement with, uh, with how an artwork is structured, I guess. Yeah, but again, I, I, I don't think that the, what's going to bring you and I closer together is that we, we somehow we agree that uh, it's, uh, it was a good move for, uh, uh, for the writer to bring back a character from the first chapter in the second last chapter. What does bring us together is when we somehow we relive that thing together and then somehow we we point out certain things to the other things. We, we draw the other person's attention to certain feature that the other person may not know. All of that is experience stuff. None of that is judgment stuff. None of that is agreement, disagreement stuff. All of it is somehow getting the other person to have to experience or re-experience the artwork as a certain way. But again, I should say that from in the context of this talk, uh, I, I do not need to say any of that stuff. This is a kind of an independent interest of mine that I, I just think, uh, um, the whole agreement, disagreement stuff is overrated, or, or I wouldn't say overrated, but really what it boils down to is to get each other to have certain experiences. So it's all about experience in the end. Okay, and uh, Jakub? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ben, Seth, for, for a stimulating talk. Um, so I was wondering, this has to do with the global aesthetics uh, part of your talk. I was wondering what, what would an aesthetic culture look like based on what you described as an, as aesthetic, as an aesthetic experience and how it would be sustained also with relation to what you said about the, you know, the social glue that uh, aesthetic uh, experiences possibly provide for, for communities. So, would you say that aesthetic, that what, what makes up an aesthetic culture is some kind of a convergence on a particular kind of aesthetic experience? Uh, and would you say that, uh, and how would you say that one can successfully control for, uh, you know, particular aesthetic uh, experiences given the volatile nature of the whole endeavor? So you can't, you know, the, the you shift the you know the goals you 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 accommodate as you go along with with what what where you experience um, yeah um, and are there anything like you know aesthetic cues or could you say that genres or something like that are you know uh, providing aesthetic cues or aesthetic guides to the aesthetic experiencing is that even possible so yeah I know this is very vague but I was just interested in your uh, opinion on this. Oh, this is these are deep deep questions for my uh, for my larger project, I guess. Um, but they are they also very important for the for the current thing. So, 
So it's tricky, right? I mean, so my, uh, my, um, my general view is that you can't really talk about aesthetic cultures because as the cultures, they divide into subcultures and really the only meaningful unit is the individual uh, or even the time slice of an individual, right? So, uh, so you can't, there's, there's no, I'm not, I'm not sure that we should expect any kind of convergence or we should expect that everyone on the Solomon Islands are gonna have the exact same experience of that thing. Uh, they won't. Uh, and, and, and I feel that I can explain why. Um, because there's not just cultural variations, there are all these interpersonal variations, because attention is different, and because mental imagery is different, and because the action is different. But there are these kind of uh, patterns, right? So, so maybe, you know, if in, in, a, in a certain culture, if what you're taught to do is to try to achieve an aesthetic experience in this way or that way, and I think that that's a really interesting um, um, one thing that, that that's kind of an interesting example for this is uh, is the formalism of the early 20th century when people were very explicitly you know for example in the Bauhaus school they were very explicitly were taught this, that this is what you have to do in order to to get a uh, an aesthetic experience you tend to the formal features and you ignore the you know what is depicted and you're paying attention to the, you know the, the composition and you know where the lines are and so on. So that so that's one way in which and then there's a very clearly teachable or, or learn, learnable way in in which in which that happened. It didn't happen in other parts of the world at that time, and didn't doesn't happen now. It didn't happen hundred years before. So so I think that there are these clusters of um, similarities in the kind of aesthetic experience that people might have in a similar kind of geographical confined and temporal confined uh, region uh, that that we might be able to explain here but again I don't I don't want to pretend that there's going to be this kind of natural clients or units of, of uh, cultural units that all have the same kind of experience so I think it's all kind of all completely fragmented but you can, but you do have these little uh, lumps of uh, similarities does, does this help yeah thank you Okay, uh, then we have, well, five minutes more. I would like to ask you something about globalism too, uh, but it's much uh, simple. Um, so you said that globalism is not an option for aesthetic experience, but- it's Universalism, uh, yeah. Universalism, but is it for perceptual experience? Um, oh, um, no. Okay. No. So, but, okay. So that's actually really cool. Uh, so I, this, this is one, one way in which the, uh, I should have structured this way, the second half of the time. So, um, so the reasons that I, uh, I gave from, at, from top down influences on perception and attention and mental imagery and the stuff that I've been um, giving for years in global aesthetics, uh, my global aesthetics talks, those are all, they're all applicable for perceptual experience in general. But the stuff that I gave today is special because that's gonna be only applicable to aesthetic experience. So that's a reason for going global aesthetics, a reason against uh, universalism that is specific to aesthetics. That's not specific, not, not kind of applicable to all perceptual stuff. So in that sense, what I was talking about today is very different from the kind of the perceptual reasons for going anti-universalist. So that's super helpful. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we have another question on Erva. Hi. Uh, my question kind of carries on with that um, and the universalism issue. Because uh, to me, when I hear that, uh, but there is still this sort of aesthetic experience that we can find in different cultures and that there is this sort of some um, common mechanism. So. Is, is that universal? That there is such a thing as an aesthetic experience? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that there's reason to think that there's some, some, there's some uni universal feature of a certain kind of aesthetic experience that um, very controversial stuff there, right? I mean, there's, a, there's been a lot of research on whether art is a culture universal, which is not a topic I'm super interested in. Uh, but I, I, I think there's reason to think that there's certain kind of aesthetic experiences, they're going to be very different, but certain aesthetic experiences that, are, that will be 
uh, there's a there's an aesthetic non aesthetic experience distinction in all cultures, and I think that there there are at least some on the basis of what we know in some cultures. Some things can be said that might be like a really important feature of all of these aesthetic experiences in different cultures, and one of them is about somehow attending not only to the object but also to your experience and how the two things are related. But I don't I I, I don't want to endorse that for the purposes of this talk. I, I said that before. Um, so so I uh, I think that's just that would need a lot of anthropology to answer this question. A lot of good good anthropology and I and I'm and I'm, that's not really been done very well before. But I think there's a reason to think that there's some kind of universality in that. I don't know, this is not a very satisfying answer, I know, but the jury is still out, but the signs are good. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Benza, for your talk. And um, well, we have now 15 minutes um, rest and you can go to the parallel sessions uh, at uh, quarter to, to, to 12. Thank you.